Thanks for joining, everyone. With me now is Marketing Director at Miles Franklin, milesfranklin.com, Ranting Andy, Andrew Hoffman. Andy, thanks for joining me. Well, thanks for having me, Max. Andy, there's a ton of resources out there now with all the libertarian leanings that people are discovering nowadays. And you're one of the folks that I've really enjoy following. And I have some questions prepared for you that I don't really hear a lot of other bloggers asking. So hopefully you can shed some light on some of these uh, issues. Sure. So over the last few years, we heard the likes of Peter Schiff and Mark Faber that uh, hyperinflation in the U.S. is imminent. And as someone who lived through the period of hyperinflation in Eastern Europe in the 90s, I'm noticing some key differences in the hyperinflationary events of the past with today's realities in America. And to name a few, all currencies in history were primarily paper-based. So if you increase the paper supply directly, it dilutes the value of all outstanding paper, especially if you correct for the velocity of money. But today's printing is just uh, typing numbers in the computer at the central bank. So couldn't the banks just park all the extra funds at the Fed and the currency would never see the light of day? Where do you stand on this whole issue of hyperinflation versus inflation versus deflation? Well, it's obviously a different world um, than it was in in previous uh, events because, well, most importantly, it's a global fiat currency now. Uh, Since the U.S. abandoned the gold standard in 1971, it's the first time in millennia since they invented paper money that there's not a single currency on the planet that's backed by anything. Previous events, such as what happened uh, in Zimbabwe or what happened in Germany or Hungary back in the 1930s and and countless other times, including in the United States, we've lost two currencies already. We've lost the the continental dollar and the confederate dollar. And if it weren't for the end of uh, civil war, we would have lost the U.S. greenback dollar that Abraham Lincoln almost hyperinflated. So the only difference is that this time it's a global phenomenon, uh, not just the, the fiat currency itself, but the fact that all the currencies that all the uh, economies are interrelated, which makes it much worse. And of course, as you said, back then they would only be able to print dollars. So there was a finite amount of dollars out there. You could see them. And today there's now they do them with computers as well as printing them. And uh, and we learn sometimes that they've been printing a lot more than they tell us, such as the 16 trillion of loans that the Fed gave out. So it's gotten to the point where it's so bad there's just so much money out there that no one has any clue how much there is. And it's, uh, you ask, how does it, how does it not just get parked at the banks? Well, I mean, some of it does get parked at banks. I, I read today about how the banks, uh, in the United, the foreign banks in the United States have all time low uh, cash levels, which means that they're not spending it. They're basically just covering their losses and, and there's no way that they're going to loan it out because they know that they're insolvent. And so there's a lot of interplaying factors that are really hard to put together. That question is such a big question. It's not even really easy to answer. But the fact is, you've seen a one-to-one correlation between the growth in, uh, in money supply and the, the price of gold over the past 12 years. And, and because you have a fiat currency uh, scheme, which is by nature a Ponzi scheme, they're going to have to keep printing more money. And as a result, the price of gold is going to keep going up because even if, if you can't count the amount of dollars out there, everyone knows that it's being done. The Chinese government knows it. The the, uh, the Arabs know it. The Russian government knows it. The ECB is saying, we're out here printing money. The Fed is saying, we're out here printing money. We're doing Operation Twist. We're doing ZERP until at least late 2014. Some of it is just based on knowing what they're doing and expecting what they're going to do and expecting, as you say, the velocity at some point to pick up when people get nervous. Okay, so to me, velocity is really key because, again, if if that money is not moving, it's just sitting there on some balance sheet, that's kind of what I'm going to look out for because that means the gallon of gas and the gallon of milk is going to really go up, which is what most people really worry about. So many stackers out there, and especially commodities investors and precious metals investors, they're predicting this massive global event that's supposed to rattle the markets and, and possibly even our way of life. For example, uh, Chris Duane believes it's going to be a this large-scale event in the real world and not in financial markets that can be manipulated. Peter Schiff was predicting a bursting of a bond bubble. Uh, all the talking heads on television are yelling about the China bubble. But all these have one thing in common. They're all, they're all black swan events. Jack Spierko from Survival Podcast has this slogan, uh, helping you live a better life if times get tough or even if they don't. So do you believe in one of those black swan events? And are you prepared if nothing at all happens during our lifetime? First, I just want to go back a second to velocity. 
because you mentioned you're looking out for it. There's actually a chart, Bill Holter at Miles Franklin wrote an article today citing a chart showing how the velocity of money has plummeted since the crisis started three or four years ago. And I mean plummeted to depression levels. Of course, these are numbers that the government tells you, so you never know what the actual numbers are, but they're probably pretty close to reality based Mm -hmm. on the economic slowdown and the fact that the savings rate has gone up and and debt has gone up. So it's not so, I mean, yeah, these numbers will at some point reflect it, but I I never trust the numbers. You'll know it when you see the price of of things move up very rapidly, and it, it will happen. Because it's a, it's going to be a confidence event. It's not going to be because the economy gets better. It's going to be because people get worried. But then you asked about, will there be a black swan event, a massive event? And I mean, I don't know if it's going to end uh, all at once. Because people say these things with confidence, like they know, as if it's happened before or they have a crystal ball. I mean, it could happen with a 9-11 event. It could happen with you wake up and... And Greece is out of the euro, and all of a sudden people are panicking and, and, and selling uh, sovereign bonds around the world. But the things you're talking about, like it's, you say, Peter Schiff says there'll be a bond bubble collapse. That's not a black swan event to me. A black swan event is something that, that would be a six or seven standard deviation, something that just historically almost never happens. And treasury bonds uh, have been crashing across the globe for the past two or three years. So It would be no surprise that the country with the most debt, the largest deficits, and the highest, uh, well, secret inflation, because they don't tell you the real numbers, has a bond crash. And the fact is, something is going to happen. Uh, It may be overnight. It may take weeks or a year, but it's going to be horrible. And, and, And when you say, am I prepared? Well, that's what I write about all day long, telling people to prepare, because it's a mathematical certainty that all fiat currency systems collapse. And the only reason this one has made it this long is because so many uh, nations are intertwined with it and have their currency reserves uh, with dollars and are therefore doing everything they can to prop it up. But as you can see, we've reached the, the, uh, the point of diminishing returns where the more money they print now, the worse things get. And that's when you, you know, you're at the end game. I think uh, you have a good point on the black swan there because, uh, after all, the bond bubble is not unpredictable. People like Peter Schiff himself, they actually saw this coming from a very long way away. So definitely a good point. You're famously investing into, into physical precious metals, and it's a relatively hardline position if you consider other investors and bloggers in the community like David Morgan, Brother John F., Chris Martinson. Many professionals receive some investment and retirement benefits through the employers. Uh, Some include equity options, discounts, 401k matching, and so on. Obviously, these investments are structured in such a way that beneficiaries are prevented from drawing anything until retirement. Uh, And for that, we have the 1978 provision to thank for the IRS code. In your investment in 100% physical, are you accounting for things like taxes, opportunity cost of uh, foregoing employer matching, and more importantly, compounding interest? Uh, Well, for one... I'm not sure what you mean by 401k matching. My employer doesn't have 401k. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I think of when I did work in corporate America, the only, I, the only job I ever had that had a 401k match was my first job uh, back 20-something years ago. Uh, most companies don't do that anymore. But either way, it's not a matter of foregoing. If you have a 401k, you can you know you put it in what the options they give you. And then when you uh, leave, you can either keep it there or take it out. I've taken every penny out of the 401ks that I had and the IRAs that were rolled over because I think the government's going to, in some some way, shape, or form, confiscate those IRAs or or make them worth less. And and as far as uh, investing in precious metals, uh, well, there's an opportunity cost of of anything. I mean, if if I buy gold and silver, the opportunity cost is that I didn't buy other things. But the fact is, gold and silver, which I've been invested 100% in for the past... um, it's over 10 years now, have outperformed every asset class on earth by far. There's no nothing that's even been close to what they've done aside from specific cases like Apple or, or something like that. That was actually my next question is, uh, yeah. is there any equities that are worth investing into? Like uh, if you have an idea, do you see any like Apples or Googles on the horizon? No, I, I mean, I don't look at paper investments anymore. My last stock that was not a precious metal stock was in the year 2000. I've not owned a non-precious metal stock for 12 years. And last year, I mean, I had had 100% of my portfolio in in mining stocks. And last year, I finally sold them all because I think the markets are rigged. 
I think they're overvalued. I think the government uh, is is attacking mining stocks and supporting other ones. And uh, and you could see that you know the average stock has been decimated. The average stock fund has been decimated. The average hedge fund has been net outflows. The only thing that's holding up uh, the Dow is government money to try to make things look good. I believe that people should get the heck out of all paper markets of all kinds. And I mean, don't be long, don't be short, don't be in stocks, bonds, commodities. Certainly don't invest in real estate or other liquid things. I believe this is the time where you are defensive. You are not looking to take your money and grow it. You are looking to protect your wealth because everything else is collapsing around it.